Hello and welcome to the channel. Today what we're going to talk about is using Azure SQL Database as a storage provider for Azure Logic Apps Standard. Now this is going to be part one of a multi-part series so be sure to come back and look for new content in the near future. So a bit about why this is important. So naturally Azure Logic Apps Standards provides organizations with a single tenant experience for running and managing their Logic Apps. Since it is a single tenant, we're able to bring our own storage provider. Now, typically when you do host in the cloud, in the Azure cloud, uh, you're gonna go ahead and provide a storage account. So it's something that Microsoft manages, but also we do have SQL as an option as well. Now, SQL can be a bit ambiguous. So when we talk about SQL, what we mean is really Azure SQL database. So essentially a PaaS offering could be SQL Server, right? So this could be running technically on-prem or you know as a full IS instance in the cloud. And also Azure SQL Managed Instance itself. Now this portability is important and we're gonna talk more about this on the channel later on when we talk about running Logic Apps Anywhere. And so as part of our Run Logic Apps Anywhere strategy, SQL provides us a fairly common technology that's well understood that allows people to use this as a storage provider independent of the Azure cloud. So depending upon your situation, that might be interesting for you. So why use SQL as a backend storage provider? So um, here's a link I'll include it in the description of the video as well if you want to link to it or take a look at it. This is part of the Microsoft documentation. So in general, we've talked about portability already. And so this allows us to have a portable runtime. And so we can go ahead and run this, you know, in multiple different situations. Uh, control. So, you know, when we talk about a PaaS service, there's generally some abstraction on purpose. You know, it's a good thing for customers. If you're not interested in the underlying details, you want Microsoft to take care of it. But for some folks, they want more control. And you can go ahead and do so with SQL itself. Now. Another interesting side of this is that, you know, when you're using storage, there's not really a whole lot you can control there. So if you're trying to reduce costs, it's difficult for you to do that. Now with Azure and you having a database and having specific like DTUs or performance characteristics, uh, you will get that predictable pricing that you're used to from a SQL Server perspective. So for some folks, this might be advantageous for you when you think about say consumption, storage isn't something that you necessarily deal with as such, but once you're into the standard SKU, you provide a storage account, this will provide you some flexibility. And I think every customer is a little bit different, and so you have to take that into account. Now, on top of that, you might have some sort of Azure hybrid benefits. You know, you might have some existing SQL Server investments. You want to be able to take advantage of that as well. That might be another thing, but it's going to be highly dependent upon a customer organization. And then lastly, we've got some compliance. Uh, we do have quite a few options when it comes to backup, restore, failover, built-in redundancies when it comes to SQL Server. So that might be of interest to you as well. Now, the question is, well, okay, that's the why, but what about the when? And so, you know, we can think about, you know, running Logic Apps in Azure with more control over storage and performance. We've talked a little bit about that. If you're well-versed in SQL and tuning and and sort of you want to be able to leverage this as a common you know data store then that might work for you as well uh, when we talk about portability you know and i think something we'll talk more about this in the future on the channel is just azure arc enabled logic apps and so this is where we start to be able to you know run logic apps in containers and naturally you need some sort of storage and uh, you might not have you know azure storage as an option and as a result you want to use sql itself Talked a little bit about predictable storage costs. We won't sort of go into that. For some folks, you might have a preference over using SQL over Azure Storage. Once again, very sort of customer specific. And then also the ability to reuse SQL in environments or investments. Like I said, maybe you've purchased some of that before. So yeah, otherwise, you know, obviously we still have the Azure Storage. It's well used, it's well tested, and that is certainly an option as well. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is give you a bit of a walkthrough of how you might go ahead and set this up. Now, one thing you know, I want to call out is just some prerequisites, uh, just so that you can uh, go ahead and have a, a smooth implementation of this. 
So naturally you need to go ahead and create your SQL instance uh, for the purpose of this exercise. I did create a net new Azure SQL database instance that I could go ahead and use for these purposes. Now, I'm not doing any sort of exhaustive uh, you know, performance testing or benchmarking that's out of scope for this video. So I did choose a, a smaller instance, which was good, it, it works. So, um, so I think it was good just from an exploration perspective. We'll see this a little bit later in the presentation, but on your SQL database itself, uh, you do need to ensure that Azure services and resources have access to your database. As you've probably run into before when using, say, SQL Server, Management Studio, there's firewalls and things like that that block connections to your database. Ultimately, it's a good thing, but we need to enable some trust between Azure Logic Apps and our database itself. The other thing is that when you provision your Logic Apps standard instance and you configure to use a database itself, you do need to use an account that has the ability to create, delete schemas, modify tables in these schemas, and also modify user-defined tables in your schemas. So generally, especially if you get into more of an enterprise scenario where things are, are rightfully locked down, uh, you will want to ensure that the account you're creating your Logic Apps instance with has these appropriate permissions with your database. So that may be something you need to talk to a database administrator if you don't have access to those levels of permissions in your, your subscription itself. So this is what I did. Went ahead, created a new Azure SQL database. Um, you know, I specified my subscription, created a resource group, provided a database name, and um, you know, it created a server for me. Like I said before, this is a non-prod, sort of a POC, so I just chose like a standard S0 environment. Uh, my mileage naturally will vary, so you know, the best to do some performance benchmarking, but if you're just wanting to kick the tires and understand how this works, this will be sufficient for you. Networking just essentially left the defaults here. Uh, we will make a change a little bit later, um, but for now I just went ahead and used the defaults and uh, basically the rest of the way in terms of the wizard itself. Now when I went ahead and, and created my database, you can see here I've got the database server and then I have my database itself. And so when I go ahead and create an, a Logic App standard instance itself, I'm going to have to go ahead and provide um, a basically a database and we're going to see that on the next screen itself but the important thing here is that I go ahead and choose that I want to use a workflow type and then also a standard plan itself. Now here's where things get interesting for us. When we get into the hosting tab the storage type we're going to go ahead and choose SQL and Azure storage. So we naturally need a storage account so if we don't have one we can create one and then we go ahead and provide the connection string of our database um, that we can go ahead and get from the Azure portal itself. So you might be asking yourself, wait a minute, why am I creating a storage account and a C providing a SQL instance? So I, I pulled this out of the docs um, inside of uh, you know, Microsoft documentation. And we can see here that if we're deploying to an Azure region, we still need an Azure storage account, which is used to complete the one-time hosting of the Logic Apps configuration on the Azure Logic Apps platform. The workflow's definition, state, run history, and other runtime artifacts are stored in your SQL database. So essentially we're storing some metadata here, but all of the configuration, the runtime characteristics, telemetry, all stored in your SQL database itself. So did want to call that out because I figured it was, uh, may have some questions from folks. Then we need to provide a plan now I'm just once again, you know, this is a POC starting off with just the smallest instance just to keep my cost down. So I'm just using workflow standard one. Once I go ahead and do that, I can provide monitoring. This is optional. If you want to use application insights, yes or no, it's up to you. And then we go ahead and we provision our Logic App standard instance. Now this is the sort of important part around the firewalls that you need to be aware of. When I provisioned my Logic App standard instance. It said it was successful. The Azure portal said, yep, yeah, resource created. And then you click on go to resource. And when I did, I got the following error right here. And this makes sense. It's trying to connect to the server, you know, from a specific IP address. And it's trying to log in, but it can't because it doesn't have access. And so what I needed to do is go to my, my SQL server 
and then be able to enable allow Azure services and resources to access this server. Flip that to yes, click save, come back to your Logic App Standard instance, hit refresh, and you're good to go from that perspective. So that's why that step is important. Now, I also checked out the SQL Server Management Studio just to see what was deployed. And so when I made my initial configuration, I just had these three tables here um, that just represent like job definitions, subscriptions, and our triggers itself. Once I went ahead and ran a transaction through, we saw a few more tables, actually quite a few more tables that are created just to handle things like our run history and our actions. So basically our tracking all of the telemetry related to our actions that are called as well. So that's something that you'll be able to find inside of your database after you've run some transactions through. So here, just gonna go ahead and do a, a very simple demo and uh, just show you how this works inside of the Azure portal. Okay, so I'm in my Logic App standard instance. Here we can see that. If I head down to configuration, um, we'll see that we've got this workflows.sql.connection string. And this is essentially our instance to our SQL database itself. So we can go ahead, copy this out, and then go ahead and log in to our database itself. So I've gone ahead and done that. I'm in SQL Server Management Studio. And uh, when we go ahead and expand the databases, we can see all of our related tables. And I found one that was interested. It looks like interesting. It looks like it's, uh, you know, contains some data about our runs. So we can see the overall status and the related timestamps of it itself. And the name of our, our logic app, which we can find here and then just a bunch of other information as well. So if we go ahead and just execute this, you can see that we've got five rows. Now, what I've done is I've gone ahead and created a logic app workflow. And here is that specific workflow itself. So it's nothing overly crazy. It's just a, essentially like a hello world type scenario, but we can go ahead and uh, copy the request trigger URL and then just go ahead and just spit out some sort of an output here. So if we head over to Postman, we can go ahead and just call this. Let's call this a couple times. As you can see, it seems pretty snappy. It's, uh, you know, seems okay. And if we head back over to our SQL database, you can see previously we had five rows. Let's go ahead and run this again. Now we're up to nine rows, just because we went ahead and called it a few times from that perspective. So yeah, there's a lot of information in here. To be honest, I need to go through and sort of do some additional exploration. Hopefully I can find enough information to come back and share that all with you. Um, but this is essentially where we'll go ahead and see our, um, our sort of information, our run history, and some other metadata about our uh, logic apps. So that concludes, you know, part one of this series. I'm gonna record another video that just talks about, okay, what does this look like from a local dev experience? And how can we use SQL database as our storage provider in those scenarios as well? So look for that in an upcoming video. Thanks again for checking out this video. Um, if you're not following me on Twitter, go ahead and find me at Weirzy. Subscribes, likes, comments, always, always appreciated. So thanks for checking out this content and we'll see you soon. Thanks, bye.